Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is January 24, 2020, and my guest is physician, author, oncologist, and Renaissance woman, Azra Raza. She's professor of medicine and director of the MDS Center at Columbia University in New York. Her book is the highly acclaimed The First Cell. Raza, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you so much, Russ. And this book is not what I expected. It's um, it's a moving and inspiring mix of the personal side of being an oncologist, along with the policy issues surrounding the way we fund and do cancer research. It is a book about death and despair. Uh, it's also a book about hope and life. It's beautifully written. It's a powerful look at what it's like to have cancer, to work with cancer patients, and probably more than anything else, a book about being a human being and all that that entails. I found it to be a hard book to read and a hard book to put down. And along the way, uh, there's a lot of policy about how we currently do cancer research. So we're going to, I hope, get into both sides of that, um, your personal story as a practicing physician, and then also the policy issues surrounding cancer research. Uh, Let's start with just MDS, which is uh, your specialty. What is it? And what's its relationship to leukemia and cancer generally? That's a good place to begin, Russ, because my career started with this. Uh, In fact, when I came to the U.S. in 1977 as a fresh medical graduate, I was uh, hell-bent on studying and treating acute myeloid leukemia, a liquid cancer, which is easier to study than a solid tumor like lung cancer, ovarian cancer, etc., By 1984, it had become very clear to me that in my lifetime, we will not be able to find the solution for acute myeloid leukemia because it is a ghastly disease and tremendously complicated. But then my many of the patients would give a history of having had a pre-leukemic phase in which their blood counts were falling, they were developing anemia, their white count was going down. And these syndromes were eventually gathered under the umbrella of myelodysplastic syndromes or MDS, which is really um, a disease by itself that can kill, but a third of these patients can develop acute myeloid leukemia and die. So I turn my attention towards catching patients' disease or acute myeloid leukemia early by trying to catch them at the MDS stage. So I was really interested in the pre-leukemia part of this MDS to begin with. You summarize our current approach to cancer as uh, slash, poison, and burn. Uh, What do you mean by that? What does each of those mean? Slash means surgery, poison means chemotherapy, and burn means radiation therapy. And what would you say is the mix of those three in our current, you know, that's our arsenal of of weapons. Has that arsenal shifted over time or has it changed much or are we still doing a lot of each? This is one of the main reasons for me to become an author suddenly because I'm not a writer. I really am an oncologist and a scientist and I've dedicated my whole life to treating patients and trying to study their disease in the laboratory. But uh, I was forced to take uh, the pen on because uh, while it is very true that we are curing 68% of cancers we see today, the reason we are curing them is mostly because of early detection. And the treatments we are giving them are by and large, the same treatments that we have been giving for 50 years, which is the slash poison burn. Now, many 
of my oncology colleagues tend to have this attitude towards me saying, Azra, we are looking at the glass being half full and you're looking at, at it being half empty. Which means why am I asking even the question that 68% patients are being cured, we should be thumping our chests, we should be giving ourselves gold medals, we should be proclaiming this from the rooftops that we are curing almost 70% of cancers diagnosed today. But I think that would be unfair to patients coming in the future. One of our family friends once told my younger brother Abbas that, look, if the sun rose from the west, everyone will stop and stare at it and wonder why. But there are a few people who see the sun rise in the east every day and wonder why. In other words, there are people who refuse to take things for granted. So I am questioning, number one, why is it that we are continuing to use the same old, same old, same old treatments despite billions of dollars being invested in trying to develop new, targeted, non-toxic, non-chemotherapeutic therapies. Why are we not looking to determine the reasons for 95% of clinical trials failing in cancer today what preclinical platforms are we using to bring those drugs to market? And then on the other hand, the 30% patients that we are not curing because they were diagnosed with an st advanced stage of their disease, their outcome today, Russ, is the same as it was 50 years ago. Even with this slash poison burn, we have made no difference to them. So basically, what is the glass half empty and what is the glass half full here? Well, we are using the same treatment. We are benefiting the patients we would have cured only because of earlier detection. And the 30% are dying terrible deaths. Yeah, I would say your book is... Um is a shout from the rooftops that 68% is not enough. <laughs> uh, and, and I think the other point, which your book painfully makes clear, is that for those 30%, the slash poison burn is, um, it's a cruel, it's a cruel approach, um, unbearable approach for a doctor who is pledged to first do no harm. It, it, we should probably explain it. You know, people who have had experience with cancer or loved ones with cancer understand this, but you should explain why it's why you use the word poison. The technique of um, of chemotherapy, which is uh, the poison part of your tr uh, trio, uh, why why do you call it poison? What is its um, modus operandi? How does it how does it work? It's literally, as somebody described it, taking a baseball bat and hitting a dog with it to get rid of its fleas. That's what giving chemotherapy is. Chemotherapy cannot distinguish between a normal cell and a cancer cell. But it kills rapidly dividing cells. That's why side effects of chemotherapy affect rapidly dividing normal cells the most. For example, hair fallout, because hair follicles grow very fast. Or we have severe nausea, vomiting, because GI tract is uh, sloughing cells and dividing very rapidly. So chemotherapy basically is a sledgehammer that goes in and starts killing cells. And because cancer cells are dividing faster than normal cells in an organ, we kill more of the cancer cells and less of the normal cells, but still normal cells die. And by the way, Res, let me stop here and tell you one other thing. We're talking a lot about immune therapies these days, and there are multiple kinds of immune therapies, but the most dramatic ones are those that use body's own immune cells to activate them and attack the cancer. You might have heard of CAR T's. Nowhere do investigators point out that while CAR T cellular therapies, the most dramatically effective form of killing every last cancer cell in the body. 
I acknowledge all of that. It is a fabulous feat of scientific achievement. Incredible. Incredible achievement to take the body's own T cells, which are a kind of immune cells, and engineer them in such a way that they are now carrying part of a B cell, which is another uh, lymphoid um, immune cell. And it's activated to kill any cell it meets, which is expressing a B cell receptor, CD19. This is the most common CAR T therapy used for B cell lymphoma or leukemia. But nowhere do investigators point out that these T cells also cannot differentiate between a normal cell and a cancer cell. So what they actually do is kill the whole organ. But specifically that organ, still there are off-target effects, which means other cells in the brain or somewhere else which are expressing the same marker. These engineered cells are so effective, they will seek out and kill every cell that even has a molecule of that receptor being expressed. So I, I saw the movie uh, Breakthrough, which I recommend to listeners. Um, it's a documentary about Jim Allison, who was a pioneer in these techniques. And um, it's, a, it's a very interesting movie for a bunch of reasons. And I think some of them will come up through the course of our conversation. But uh, the one I want to focus on is that it's a very celebratory movie. It is a, it is it is yelling from the rooftops that we've made an enormous amount of progress, and it highlights some wonderful, miraculous, heartwarming stories of people who had a death sentence that was re- 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 revoked, and they they're they're fine. It's not just like uh, they're they're alive; they're doing well. And what the movie leaves out, uh, as the economist, I had to notice the two things, the, the most important things it leaves out. One is it doesn't help that many people. It's a very small group that, unfortunately, it's a small group that these techniques are working on with that kind of effectiveness. Second thing, they don't talk about the cost. Um, in fact, the the pharmaceutical company uh, in, the, in the film, the courageous one that keeps a trial going, that, that was a failure. There's some great, wonderful things there. But, of course, they have to compensate for their enormous risk they take in extending a trial way beyond its normal, its normal time, which, of course— could have failed and cost them hundreds of millions of dollars. It it turned out it worked, which is great. But anyway, cost is ignored, which it often is in these kinds of stories. And then uh, it ignores the fact that it's a small group. And that's the tragedy that you're focusing on. The breakthroughs that we have made have been, as you say, some of them have been just glorious. But unfortunately, they don't apply very widely, at least yet. Uh, So react to that and also... The possibility that it might expand to treat other cancers right that we don't know about right now. There might be other forms of this therapy that could reach a wider range of people, or is that not the case? Russ, one of the big problems we have faced in cancer is that despite looking for 60 years, we have not been able to find molecules that are expressed only by cancer cells and not by normal cells. In other words, we can't find the address, the unique zip code of a cancer cell so far. So at best, what we are trying to do is basically kill cells more effectively, irrespective of whether they are cancerous or or normal. When you ask me that, will this immune therapy be applicable to other cancers? Absolutely, it should be applicable. But right now it is not so because if we try to kill liver cancer cells with this kind of CAR-T therapy, it will destroy the whole liver, not just liver cancer cells, or it would destroy the whole GI tract, the whole colon. So the entire organ would be killed because normal cells are expressing the same markers as the cancer cells. However, when we learn to identify by means of whatever biomarkers we develop in the future as technology is evolving, then not only would we be able to uh, specifically target cancer cells, but the other thing is that we would be able to use these therapies in earlier stages so that right now, when we give these therapies, 
the only patients who respond are the ones who experience the most severe side effects called the cytokine um, storm which basically puts the patient's life at stake that if they survive it they will enter remission those patients who don't experience this horrendous cytokine storm they don't even eventually respond to this kind of therapy in other words what i'm saying is that we are going in the right direction we have made some significant dramatic advances in these kinds of immune therapies but the way they are talked about the hyperbolic language that is used minimizing not just the financial toxicity but actual physical yes. toxicity of immune therapies and then let's take just chemotherapy you asked me why do i call it as this uh, poison it's because recently i saw a 42 year old uh, beautiful woman who came to see me because suddenly she had uh, developed weakness and fatigue and had uh, was uh, seen by her primary care physician and found to have low blood counts i do a bone marrow and i find that she has acute myeloid leukemia now i look at this gorgeous young woman who stoned and tanned and i shudder to think what i will be doing to Uh, what she will look like in another 6 weeks after the chemotherapy we give her so the question i'm asking is i was giving the same two drugs in 1977 to treat a patient like her that i am using today in 2020 the same two drugs with the same dreadful results how long will we continue to do it what is there for the future how can we change it and one of the worst things and the last thing i want to say about it is that do you know to this day we don't know how those two drugs work we have no mechanism of action precisely laid out for them so what is the advance we have made in acute myeloid leukemia then so part of your book is an indictment of the i don't know what you want to call it the, the intellectual infrastructure of the pharmaceutical industry and the research behind it that both you know private and public that uses a set of um clinical trials typically on mice and then it goes up uh to a a larger animal typically i think a dog um before it goes to a human and we we understand that it's hard to experiment on humans for lots of reasons but your point about mice is that it's not just well you know not every time a it works out that it works on a mouse it doesn't work on a human in fact it almost never works on a human if it works on a mouse and this is um this whole intellectual structure is uh is a mistake in your view it's a reductionist attempt to hone in on the the micro uh cellular level for for this causal you know we're trying to close the door on this one little entry when in fact that whole approach you're suggesting is is wrong because cancer is so complex and it's not just complex meaning it's hard to figure out it's complex meaning it's multivariate and it's different in every person even and so the whole approach we're using of this mouse driven reductionist approach at the cellular level is unlikely has failed more or less and is unlikely to to get any better and we're throwing hundreds of about billions of dollars at it. You said it better than I could have said really. Well, I read your book. You know, read- <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I have a convert in yeah, you. Yeah, well, I'm worried about <laughs> it. Yeah, uh, well, let me oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say that science has succeeded where magic failed because we are interested in understanding things and we think that we learn to control nature. and that power will be the byproduct of our understanding and that is why i think the intent to try and study and understand cancer is uh, got to be applauded the problem is that there aren't that many cancer cells available coming from humans for basic scientists to study so they have gone ahead and made uh, 
models and again the intent is very good and to study the biology of cancer animal models are fantastic so i want to make this distinction very clear over and over that i'm not against the use of animal models and mouse models to try and understand the mechanisms the biological basis for phenomena that we observe that's all exactly what these models should be used for but there seems to be like an emotional mason dixon line cleaving <laughs> on colleges from basic scientists when it comes to developing uh, new chemotherapies my contention russ is that all research on cancer should have one and only one goal which is to benefit the cancer patient it's all very well to study biology in mice and rabbits and fruit fly and zebra fish but if it is not therapy driven if it's not going to help my patient then for me it is of no use and spending hundreds of billions of dollars to identify the next intracellular signaling pathway in a tumor that is artificially created in a mouse is complete waste of money for me especially when we talk about drug development the idea that we can create a tumor in an animal model treat it with a given agent and then bring those results to the human bedside well this has made met with unmitigated disaster and the reasons that you have very clearly pointed out is that yes cancer begins in one cell but the cell keeps dividing it's uh, covering one generation within hours which it should normally cover in months if uh, if not even longer so that these rapidly dividing cells make dna copying errors which are known as mutations so every time a cancer cell divides into two it picks up new mutations which means now there are potentially two entirely new cancers it's something like the brain has a 100 billion cells but one quadrillion connections the same way a cancer begins in a cell but then it has the potential of constantly moving constantly changing and undergoing metamorphosis so that within days there is now a mixture of heterogeneously biologically distinct populations of cells within a tumor and i always say that treating cancer like one disease is like treating africa as one country it's not the same even in two sites in the same patient or two days in the same patient the same the tumor has changed so how can we apply a reductionist approach in this tsunami of chaos within a tumor along with its micro environment the intracellular signaling the immune response the blood supply the angiogenesis taking all of this complexity and trying to bring our reductionist scissors to it and trying to find one molecule and develop one mo- magic bullet for it it hasn't worked for 50 years oh, sorry. this is why sorry no go ahead finish your thought i was saying this is why 50 years later we are still using slash poison and burn and the other 30% patients are still dying the same way and for the 60% 70% we are using slash poison burn we don't even understand how those things are working yes yeah, so i was just going to say um i i think you were wrong you said i said it better than you but i think that that was not true that was beautifully said uh the other part of this of course and we've talked about this on other episodes um related to these issues and uh, let me try to summarize this. this is the way i see it as an economist um we have a medicare system which is for old people which does not um negotiate drug prices and as a free market economist i love that we don't negotiate drug prices i don't think the government excuse me i, I don't think the government should be setting the price of drugs i don't think that's a good thing However, at the same time, and these two things don't work well together, at the same time, any increase in efficacy, no matter how tiny, an increase in lifespan, a median increase of of 2 months is now becomes the the um 
gold standard of treatment and is paid for by Medicare. So basically, there's an enormous incentive, which the drug companies have, pharmaceutical industry, to make marginal improvements at enormous cost, creating new drugs that can be patented, which they, of course, have uh, an incentive to find, that are paid for by a third party, me, the taxpayer, uh, without regard to whether that money is worth it. There's no skin in the game, or I would say it differently. It's the wrong skin in the game for the pharmaceutical company. They are motivated by profit, which is a glorious thing. You, you say so in the book at one point in a sentence I'm not going to quote, but it's really well said that basically you say they give people a goal and an incentive to find it. They'll, they'll, they'll work at it. And we, yet we've created a set of incentives for the pharmaceutical industry that is not healthy. And that combination of patent protection, marginal, and I mean marginal, meaning small, increases in efficacy, paid for at virtually without any restraints, is an enormous waste of money. And, and your book, you're not an economist, but much of your book is, 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 could be summarized as saying the cost-benefit of this is out of whack. This is not an effective use. Now, that story you just told of, of why the current approach doesn't work well, you could react to that with despair. Um, you could say you certainly at a minimum don't want to throw good money after bad to continue that approach, which is what we're doing in your view. That, but the question would also then be, well, what would replace it other than despair? If the current approach is an utter failure in your view, and I'm going to maybe push back on that in a minute, but let's start with that. If it's an utter failure and it's financially uh, a mistake, the way it's structured to waste resources relative to return, what might replace it? What could do better? I think, again, excellent um, analysis of our healthcare uh, doldrums right now. It's no surprise that only 20% of Americans have any confidence in the healthcare system today. In fact, 20% of Americans are being hounded by collectors for medical bills. Yeah, we had a recent, ep we had a recent episode on that. Uh, it hasn't aired yet, but uh, with uh, Marty McCary on this yeah. problem of, of uh, unpaid bills. I would say, though, Osra, to be fair, I think most Americans love their health care system. And that's I think it's actually a quite high number there. It's in the I think in recent polls I saw. I don't know if it's a good poll or not. You have to be careful. But it's something in the 80s, 80 uh, percent or more like they're or satisfied with their with their health care. We have extraordinary health care in the United States I, for most Americans, not all. Many Americans have horrible access to it, but too many. But but the but so many have a gloriously, fabulously innovative and technologically advanced, amazing set of options, and they're delivered without waiting. And it's, it, it's, and, and you get access to incredible minds like yours and training and experience. And it's not, it's, it's sometimes even done with compassion. So it's a wonderful system, but the price that we pay for it is, seems to be way out of whack for what we get in return. And uh, that's simply the reason I think we're so happy with it is that we don't have to pay the price directly. We don't realize what the full price is. But but I I want I want you to I want to move away from unless you want to add something I want to move away from this issue of the of the overall system and just focus on what you think the best your book's called the first cell for a reason uh, what do you think we should be doing differently yes. we need a different approach yes thank you so much for bringing me back to the important <laughs> uh, the optimistic part of yeah, my book let's hear it although although. Uh, Ross, I have to say that uh, the subtitle of my book is almost as important as the title. The subtitle is the human cost, so of of trying to continue to persist in the same old, same old. Because this is why I look at everything we are doing in cancer through the prism of human anguish. What are the patients and their families going through uh, when we practice the current form of treatment? I mean, clearly, if we treat a disease, any time we treat a disease, we have a 50% chance of winning and 50% chance of losing. But the way I have tried to look at it in the book is if we treat the person, then we have a 100% chance of winning. We have to stop the self-deception that is limiting our ability to risk new areas of research and give up the uh, sclerotic old ones. One thing we learn in medicine 
over the years of practice and seeing as i do 30 to 40 cancer patients every week for the last 40 years one thing you learn is that how you want things to be makes no difference at all and at every step of the way i have to stop and ask myself what is the categorical imperative at this point what should i be doing for this patient that would should become law tomorrow um as kant's categorical imperative is and this is what keeps brings me to look at the whole cancer issue in a different light now so far our strategy has been as you and i have been discussing for the past 45 minutes is that we try to kill every last cancer cell in the body but the only thing that's really worked for cancer in the last 50 years is that we have brought down cancer mortality by 1% a year which is no laughing matter nothing to frown at because that has translated in the last 3 decades into a 27% decline in mortality but most of that has happened for two reasons one because the anti smoking campaign finally began to show some results so that kinds of cancers we were seeing associated with that have declined but more importantly or equally importantly is that we are detecting cancers earlier and earlier instituting whatever terrible treatments we have but at least instituting them early so we know clearly since 1907 that it's not cancer that can kill but it's the delay in the treatment that kills and the earlier we detect the disease the better and then we have to try and kill every last cell yes but we are not detecting cancer early so the question is why in this day and age of supreme technological advances magnificent scanning and imaging devices and handheld devices and cellular phones etc and self driving cars why are we still using 50 year old methods uh to look at psa to look at mammograms or to put a tube into someone's gut to try and find a cancer by looking for it those are really uh have to be changed so how do we change them and before before you do that i i, I want to say that when i first heard the title of your book and i read a paragraph brief description of it i thought i'm going to hate this book uh <laughs> because you know this idea that we need to screen more effectively which is a big theme of the last 25 years get your get your colon colonoscopy once you turn 50 get your mammogram once you turn 30 maybe even or 40 uh get the PSA test many of these screening techniques as we've talked about many times on the program and as you talk about in the book they've led to more harm than good they've We're not going to talk about each one individually or and I'm not we're not giving medical advice on the program but I think listeners know well what some of these tests are and you should read about them before you just uh, unthoughtfully just get one because you hear that it's a good idea many of these tests the false positives the test itself the anguish the um the the damage it's done is 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 worse than the, than the disease the net effect is often zero or negative on mortality And so when I first heard about your book I thought well this is going to be an easy book to dislike because uh the idea that we should screen earlier and often and of course there are people who sell such scans uh and say you could have cancer right now go look and you know my view has always been most of the times better not to look uh, at least under current technology so I was relieved reading your book that you know all that of course <laughs> Uh so when you talk about earlier detection and and uh screening you don't necessarily mean the, the current arsenal which is um I I think a tragedy in many cases I I've, I've uh, Vinay Prasad coming on the program soon and he's written very powerfully on Twitter and I'm, he's got a new book coming out we're going to I'm going to read uh for their interview called Malignant which he's very aware of these uh these failed screenings so when when you advocate for the first cell meaning the beginning of the very beginning of cancer and nipping it in the bud you're not saying we need to do more of the current set of screening what do you have in mind 
So what I have in mind is that we, I myself just talked about the failure of the reductionist approach that basic scientists and oncology researchers have used to try and look for one gene and uh, uh, and, and and try to find a magic bullet to um, undo the harm that gene is doing. But in fact, we are all guilty of this reductionist approach. So if you think about cancer, there are cancer cells, then the cells have DNA in the genes. DNA um, transcribes RNA, and this is translated into proteins, and then proteins are metabolized. So now we have five compartments, cells, RNA, DNA, proteins, metabolites. Why should we look at any one of them or any one gene in DNA or any one protein signature? We should be looking at everything simultaneously. So with this kind of an approach, which is more pluralistic, using the latest technology, what I'm proposing is that there are patients who, are, who have cancer today. Many times I'm asked this question, Russ, if you have acute myeloid leukemia, Dr. Raza, you are being so critical about the treatment, seven and three, would you take the treatment? My answer is, of course, I'll take the treatment because every human wants to have hope. I want to be that one unicorn who's going to be the exception. And 30% patients with uh, acute myeloid leukemia will survive five years even today. So I'll take that chance, sure. But the question I'm asking is, why is this the only choice being offered? How can we do better tomorrow? So now it comes to two issues. One is that we have patients today for whom we need treatments and we need to invest resources to try and improve those treatments and find better ones. I'm saying that the other half of resources need to go to improve the technology we have for earlier detection, which means a really serious, thorough overall uh, analysis of cells, RNA, DNA, proteins, metabolites from serially, sequentially studied actual human samples, not animal models. And the last thing I want to say about this is that this is where real large-scale studies will have to evolve to provide the sample size for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Since 1984, when I turned my attention towards studying pre-leukemia and following these patients as they either died of MDS or developed leukemia, I started banking bone marrow and blood samples on my patients. Today, Russ, this may sound like a very ordinary thing, but I have uh, uh, I have now collected over sixty thousand samples from thousands of patients. Not one cell in my tissue bank has come from another investigator. All of these patients mean something to me because I've personally taken care of them. Most of the marrows I have done with my own hands. This is a tissue repository where. Today, I can go in, look at the cells, look at RNA, DNA, proteins, and metabolites in a serial fashion as the patient progressed from pre-leukemia to acute leukemia. This is how we can work our way back and then ask the question, why did some patients get pre-leukemia? What were the risk factors that made this individual or these people susceptible to getting pre-leukemia even? And this would take us then to identify a group that is at high risk of developing pre-leukemia, and then we can start monitoring those individu healthy individuals who are at high risk in a targeted fashion. So I can do this for pre-leukemia and acute myeloid leukemia. The resources are needed. I am making this appeal to everybody that we should not rely on any one test done annually, which was developed 50 years ago. Rather, we need to develop using the latest scanning, imaging, biomarking, uh, genomic, proteomic, metabolomic technologies to find maybe 500 different tests that can be amassed in a barcode fashion or can be done 
rapidly, quickly uh, to identify individuals in the earliest stages of cancer. Uh, the resources, half the resources go to treating current cancer patients and developing and improving treatments for them. The other half must be invested towards early detection through the latest technology and prevention and nipping the cancer in the bud. So the way I would think about it, and you talk about it in passing in a number of places in the book, is that when you use the word reductionist, you're focusing in on a – you're not focusing in. You're talking about research. You focus in on a uh, a small causative window that does not capture the full building. And you have an amazing story, which I just want to read because – I loved it so much. Uh, you were talking with um, uh, George Washington University uh, Dr. Ayub Omaya, a neurosurgeon, and uh, he was talking about the brain. And you asked him, uh, what would be the final level of reductionism needed to cite the root of consciousness? Meaning, where are we going to find consciousness in the brain? Is it over here? Is it over there? Is it the the amygdala is at the frontal cortex. Is it the way da da da? And he's what his answer is a deep insight that is um, very relevant for economics and and life. You said he said the following quote: Azra, taking apart the Taj Mahal brick by brick to discover the source of its beauty, will yield only rubble. It is the same with the brain. The emergent complexity from simple individual parts accounts for its essential mystery. And you add, it is also the reason why cancer will not yield its secrets through a reductionist approach. Of course, that reductionist approach is how people are trained. It's how people grow up in medical school. It's how they grow up in pharmaceutical research. It is the, um, it's the default. And by the nature of our scientific funding system, uh, where existing scientists approve grants to new scientists, typically, uh, in the place of bureaucrats. It's sort of better, uh, but it's got the problem of groupthink. And you're you're demanding, and it's beautiful, you are demanding an, not an end to that groupthink because you concede, and yeah, I think you have to concede, that there, there have been advances through that. I was going to push back against you earlier and say, you know, this animal model, at least – if we hadn't followed it, we wouldn't have gotten to these immune therapy techniques, and they have led to a lot of good things. And um, even if it's only 30 percent, it's 30 percent, better than nothing. Uh, whether it's worth it, it's a different question. Your point is, is that we need to try some different approaches, and the current system is not designed for imagination. It is not designed for creativity. I mentioned Jim Allison earlier, uh, who was uh, a key part of this in the in the documentary Breakthrough. Uh, it's pretty obvious when you watch that film that Jim Allison's not normal. Thank God, Jim Allison is is a maverick. He he's he was a a crusader who was overconfident, could have been wrong, but believed in a a set of observations and a strategy for fighting cancer that people had seen fail over and over and over again. This idea of immune therapy it had failed. It's not just like oh he tried this and it worked. It it, it failed over and over again, and he yet he persisted. He stood on that rooftop and, and said, I think this is going to make a difference. And he did. And I would argue that the current system needs a lot more trial and error. It's the wrong kind of trial and error we're using now, this reductionist animal mice-based approach. We need a, a a world where there's a bunch of islands where people are trying radically different approaches that you're talking about. And I know we have listeners to Econ Talk who are capable of funding such approaches. And I know you know about some of those uh, who aren't listeners. You, but it seems to me you need a very wealthy person who doesn't – who sees the world through your eyes and says, enough. We need to stop spending as much money as we're currently spending on this, and the current system is not designed to change. So we need to have an end around. And so that's the way I see your book is uh, – I mean, it's possible that that the FDA and, and others will – you know, the – National Cancer Institute, NIH, will 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 see that that you're right, but it's also, I think, more likely, and in, in the history of science to me bears this out, that someone will say, um, "Let's try something different. Let's try something radically different. Let's dream." And most of those dreams will fail, just the nature of things. But as you point out, you have a wonderful data set, this tissue repository. It just needs some money to help 
let it shed some light on things. Not just some money. It needs uh, quite a bit of money. (laughs) And the money is very easy to raise, actually, because uh, one thing I would like to point out is that one in five new cancers occur. And I don't want to scare anyone, Russ, but statistics are important in some places. And unless we are aware of uh, the tiger in the bush, we are not going to be careful. Yeah. So this is why I point this out to you, that one in five new cancers appear in a cancer survivor. And the worst case was my husband. He had the first cancer at 34 years of age and a completely different one at 57, of which he died. Because the underlying reasons that led to the first cancer are still there. And then we have also created more damage by giving chemotherapy for that first cancer. But luckily, we are successful in treating 70% of cancers almost today so that there are a lot of cancer survivors, 2016 to 17 million now, and by 2025, there'll be 20 million cancer survivors. They are the ones who should be most carefully watched and monitored for the appearance of the first cell. If only 1 million of them give $10 a month for a year, That is all I would need to study the tissue repository. That's the kind of um, public awareness that could really help do this sort of thing. Um, And the other model is what you suggested, that a great philanthropist with a big heart suddenly uh, realizes that, yes, uh, here is some tissue that has been collected for 35 years and it's sitting in freezers right now. Um, Whereas if we invest this money within a few years, we will have all of these uh, uh, multiple compartments well studied that I talked about. And um, and surely, uh, even if we don't find the first cell within the next two years, we will have so many new insights into how this disease is uh, uh, progressing and uh, expanding and killing that all of this would be worth uh, worth our while. I do think that um, it's very important for uh, for the public at large to understand that uh, not the kind of uh, smoke and mirror approach we have used to convey cancer news seems to have created an impression in the public that great advances have been made. Unfortunately, I don't agree that great advances have been made while fully admitting, and there's no reason to deny it. I'm very much on the front lines myself, Russ. So there's no question that I'm doing this every day. It's not like I'm some author who's writing yeah. this research. I am seeing 40 patients a week. I am a cancer widow and I am in a lab doing basic research for 35 years. So I don't need to be lectured by anybody about how much advances have occurred in cancer. Of course, I appreciate them. I practice them. I told you I would take the same treatment that's offered if I get acute leukemia today. My husband took the treatment. I gave it to him. The same treatment that killed his entire immune system and eventually caused such severe infection that he died of sepsis. But I gave it to him because it gave him a chance of survival also. And he did survive for five years thanks to the treatment we gave. But But it's uh, a tough five years. Yeah, it was very tough. And the point I make now is that it's just unfair to patients coming in the future to keep insisting that we are making great advances and this incremental success is fine and we should keep investing $150 billion a year into treating cancer and whatever number we spend in doing research in the same old, same old way. No, I do think that uh, we can see clearly what is failing. And instead of investing, I'll give you one last example. Let's say that this immune therapy is working in lung cancer. And one drug gets approved. Seems to be. Seems to be doing some. Yeah. And let's say it gets approved, the one one chemo, uh, immune therapy gets approved. The same immune therapy has also worked in, let's say, a melanoma. Now they do a trial in multiple myeloma and other bone marrow cancer. 
And what happens is that instead of one trial, there are not 500 trials, there are not 1,000, there are 2,200 trials going on to ask the same question. Now, each clinical trial costs millions of dollars. Phase one costs 25 million and phase three costs anywhere from 500 million to 2.5 million billion dollars. Why do we need 2,200 trials to ask the same question? Instead of all this redundant uh, waste of resources in trying to make a quick buck, we are uh, through which we are stifling creativity. We are stifling research and development of novel targets because we are just trying to rush and make money by me too, me too kind of approach. I'm insisting that we stop all of that and redirect the resource. There's plenty of money. For God's sake, America is the most affluent country in the most affluent of times. We should be able to invest in this properly and really make sure that the future cancer patients are served better. Well, I want to come back to emergence. I mean, I think one of the challenges here is that you may see that as wasteful. The current incentives encourage it. Uh, some good things come out of it, uh, but for all of its flaws, it might be better than a, a cancer czar who allocates um, money unless you are the czar. And then even if you are the czar, you might start acting differently uh, once you became the czar. Uh, and czars tend to stifle creativity generally as well. So it strikes me when I think of the institutional changes that I would think about to get us closer to your vision than, than the current one. Uh, a set of prizes would maybe be a better idea. There are a set of prizes, of course, built into the system right now, just that those prizes are structured in ways that encourage um, another slice of the salami rather than a different approach that might have a much bigger impact. So um, I, I think it's a, it's a very tough problem. And I think politically, it's very hard to change that current system. And you know, your book is an attempt to raise consciousness about it. I think that's great. Listeners to this program maybe will now think a little bit differently about it, but I, I, it's a hard problem. And I think the the end around approach is ultimately uh, probably where we need to get to. Uh, you know, we see this already in, in the way technology is being used for medicine in creative ways outside of the current system, whether this current system will approve those ways for funding, et cetera, of course, remains to be seen. But um, let's... Let's switch, uh, if we might, to the personal side of the book, which was really um, devastating and inspiring at the same time. You have a lot of stories about the suffering of, of patients. And um, when I first started reading that, those parts of the book, I, I actually thought, you know, why is this in here? Do I really need – I mean, I, it's depressing. Um, it's sad, 23-year-old dying of, of uh, cancer – surrounded by friends and parents. It's it's unbearably sad. And I think but there's two things about it that are that I think are important. One is it's beautifully written. It's inspiring the way people can love in those settings. Um but more than that, it it reminds you and you have to remind people of of what's going on in behind closed doors in, in the halls of the buildings that you're in every day and that the rest of us mercifully are not which is that human toll. And it is um, it's very, very difficult and very powerful. So I want to talk a little bit about that, that personal side. Um, you mentioned the death of your husband. You write about in the book. Um, you talk about in the aftermath of that, you were, I would describe it, you were in a daze. Uh, and you talked about how fiction and reading helped you. Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, you're so right about this, Russ, that the science can finish, but the human stories go on. And I do think that the most important part of my book relates to the patients who are living today who agreed to write in the book uh, their own wonderful experiences through terrible times, uh, that are the only beacons of hope in this terrifying darkness that cancer brings with it. And 
the fact that families of these patients were willing to be interviewed and when i asked them to cast a backward glance on their experience and see what parts they could have changed what decisions they could have altered what now with the uh, luxury of time and with the acceptance that comes eventually with time what can they point to that they should have done differently and i think those are the most powerful and moving statements coming from the families when they talk about their loved ones dying it's true that the dizzying and disorienting um daily uh, challenges of cancer can really bring a fog down upon you a daze upon you and and no sooner do you get used to one situation that suddenly everything changes and now you have to adapt to completely new findings and new test results and new challenges and new physical symptoms etc it's very difficult so important uh, part of the book is looking back trying to bring some method to the madness and eventually coming to the conclusion that in fact the only answer is that there is no answer that we are trying to bring uh, some sort of rationality to randomness and disease and uh, none of it makes sense and at some level one needs to accept it how do you develop this uh, ability to continuously witness the kind of pain and suffering and anguish that people are going through at one point for me poetry has been very important to us because uh, i come from an intensely and a deeply oral culture where reciting poetry and memorizing poetry is crispered into our dna at birth <laughs> and we um growing up at home in karachi pakistan my parents made it a point that all seven of their children were made to memorize hundreds and hundreds of verses in urdu and english and sometimes in persian as well and very often that uh, the kind of two lines of a ghazal which is a form of uh, uh, a very stylized uh, of poetry in my language urdu uh, two lines of a of this form of poem are to me like two strands of the dna in a microcosm is contained a macrocosm of meaning and it teaches you things that are impossible to verbalize often and at one point i remember when i was 32 years old and faced with uh, one of my patients jc who was extremely ill and she was only 34 so we were practically the same age and one day instead of uh, telling her jokes trying to distract her i read her a piece of uh, a poem that i had memorized uh, which i'll recite for you just now Uh, and for your listeners please um it's a poem by subhash mukhopadhyay who's a bengali poet and it's in translation this condition of life is not for the whole year only for the few months when it rains the blazing fire of the dry wood will cook rice in no time and whatever is there will come back into view sharp and clear when the rains depart we will put out in the sun everything that is wet wood chips and all put out in the sun we shall even our hearts and reading this poet to jc we both just burst out crying at the end and it was some form of a catharsis for both of us yeah. and you know jc was someone who's dying at 34 who has two and a half twin uh, two and a half year old twin daughters and the 
I mean, she didn't give me any lectures. She did not have any uh, books that she wrote. She did not have gold medals that she had won in her academic career. Nothing like that. And yet she allowed me to witness and experience grace in its truest form in the way she accepted the disease. And the way she accepted her death, it was as if she rejoiced her, in her death in that she met the challenges of life with all the passion that she could bring into those last few months. And the noble way in which she passed through those, past, those last few months of her life, became indelibly tattooed on my cerebrum forever. And so much of what we shared, we shared a lot of poetry together. We shared, and, and with other patients also. I mean, just reading fiction is so important because it allows one to poach on the experience of others. It allows one to stand in the shoes of others. It allows one to see whole lives evolve and consequences of decisions that they made, examined and re-examined. It teaches you to learn about yourself because you declare your feelings for one character and not for another. You like this one, you hate that one, and this gives you insights into yourself. So for me, learning to deal with real human tragedies has been tremendously helped by the great writers of our, uh, of our literature. I was listening to you talk about JC, you write about beautifully in the book as well. And you're talking about the, that she had no tangible accomplishments like a book, no tangible signifiers like a gold medal. But the way I think about her and people like her and the people we know like that is that she's an artist. Her raw material was the tragedy of her disease. And she somehow molded and crafted it into something extraordinary. And um, I think that's the privilege that, that a doctor can have, a nurse can have. I was, uh, I was recently visiting my dad in the hospital, and he was there for five days and not in very good shape at 89. And, you know, the nurses who I saw every day have this great gift. Um, they have the gift to give, and they have the gift to receive. And that gift of receiving is often forgotten, that that. I asked one of them, I said, why do you, it's such a hard job. Why do you, he just said, well, it's rewarding. Um, he said more than that, but it, but for him, it was a, um, clearly a labor of love, which is the highest level, I think, uh, someone in a caring profession can, can bring to that. I have to quote Emery Austin in your book. You said, you said, you quote her saying, some days there won't be a song in your heart, sing anyway. And I think, you know, someone who's who's dying, and of course, we're all dying to some extent, but someone who's dying in extremis, someone who's dying in pain and loss of dignity and, and anguish, um, to sing anyway is the highest form of art, it seems to me. Yes, absolutely. You're so right in saying the things you just said. For me, I'll tell you that my one of my most favorite fiction books of all times is, of course, uh, Moby Dick by Melville. For one reason, it helped me understand the storms in the souls of men that make them go wailing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for another, at one point, he, he says something to the effect, I don't remember the exact quote, but there's something to the effect that Pequod was his, uh, the, sh the, the, the whaling ship on which he was standing and he said something like uh, the deck of Pequod was my Harvard and my Yale which means that experience can teach you in an instant um, so much more about the mystery and the essential wonders of what makes us such complicated human beings and how each of us deals with the questions of mortality and questions of living and dying. I do think that uh, the patient's corporeal language 
writes books in instances for us. If we have the eyes, not just the eyesight, but the insight to appreciate what they are telling us. Talk about the role of listening as a doctor um, and why it's important. I think it's a lost art. It's a lost art for all of us, but I think particularly for doctors who are filling out their their electronic forms and racing to the next patient. And I think the luxury of listening is frequently lost. We've had some doctors talk about it before here on the program, but I'd like to hear it from you. What role does it play in your practice? You know, I read about a study uh, where if you put a finger in front of your eyes and move, start moving it, let's say, to the right eventually, and keep staring straight in front, eventually the finger would move out of your peripheral vision and then it will disappear, right, at some point. But not for the deaf. <laughs> it doesn't disappear in the peripheral vision that quickly for the deaf, hmm. which means that they are seeing more seeingly than us. And the same way I insist to the younger doctors who are in training with me that they have to hear more hearingly. <laughs> it's not enough to just sit silently and uh, and let the patient talk. But how do you hear more hearingly is the question. Right now, the doctor's um, Doctor-patient relationship is such that 80% of our time is spent in front of computers and 20% is spent in face-to-face -face interactions. And when there are deep concerns that are torturing a patient, they can't express it immediately. An average of uh, two minutes of conversation has to occur uninterrupted before the patient will start to express even what is keeping them up at night or what their real issues are. And yet doctors are known to interrupt a patient every 18 seconds. <laughs> so I think, I mean, everyone means well. It's not that we are heartless oncologists who are just trying to do everything for a paycheck and just finish 12 patients we have to see in the morning and rush out and finish the paper. No, it's not that. Somehow it's disorienting. It's very distressing. It's terrifying to have to look so deeply into the, the agony that uh, is in front of us. And I do think that it has to be done, though. It, we have, if we can't help our patients to live better lives, we don't have to to let them have to be a wreck, emotional wrecks. We have to help them, and that comes from uh, really taking a human interest, which means you have to bring all your emotional, spiritual, physical, intellectual abilities to bear and learn how to concentrate and focus on what is uh, the patient's real issue, uh, not just the cure part, but the healing part of it is as important. I hope that answers your question. In the aftermath of uh, your loss of your husband, uh, you, you write about the profusion of inappropriate things that people say and Attempts of consolation. I think about this um, from time to time. I think people blunder um, badly. In, in Jewish practice, when you go to the home of a mourner, Jewish law says that you're not to speak until the mourner speaks. And I think people find this very difficult. Um, our silence makes us uncomfortable, and we tend to blurt out things that often are worse than being silent. And you talk about that as an example uh, in your own personal situation. But I've always thought about this as uh, it's one of those rare examples where uh, a black and white rule like that is actually quite helpful. Sometimes those rules are just the best we can do. But the idea that to sit in silence with a person who's suffering and saying nothing, which 
you know, that silence is yelling at us often. Talk, 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 say something. And just to sit there and let the other person speak first. And I've always thought of that injunction as being about allowing the, is to keep you from saying something inappropriate. But I think it also has a deeper meaning, which is it's to get you to listen. It's not just don't talk, it's listen. And I'm curious, I I like that rule. I think it's a really helpful rule to start, but I'm curious what advice you would give people in situations of tragedy for how to behave and how you, you don't have to go into the the ones that didn't help you, but I'd be curious if you would talk about some of the ones that, that did help. I mean, there were some wildly absurd reactions from people like uh, somebody came after Harvey died and offered to take me out to singles bars. (laughs) Another person uh, wanted to uh, console me in a way, but the manner in which she did it was quite outlandish. She said, Azra, I'm so sorry Harvey died, but don't worry. You'll join him soon and you two can live happily ever after in heaven. (laughs) That was really breathtakingly strange to me. Um, And then there was that one of, he's gone, but you look great. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) There's that one. Congratulations. Don't be sad. You look fabulous. (laughs) I think there's a terrible challenge in our culture these days that no one's allowed to be unhappy for any, you know, mourning is against the rules. So if if you look sad, I've got to try to cheer you up. I can't ever just let you be sad. <laughs> You've got yeah. to find something. Your food's but delicious. <laughs> Boy, your house looks great. <laughs> a lovely outfit. Yeah. But it's actually the inability of people to communicate with each other. Yeah, it's true. Not particularly... I mean, especially emotionally. So what you see around you are people who are unable, in fact, not just to communicate with each other, but then to give sympathy and to receive sympathy also. In a way, it reminds me very much of The Sound of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel, because Basically, that is the meaning of what is the sound of silence? Uh, is it the rustling of leaves, the sound of silence? Is, is, is it the flowing water in a brook when you're sitting in a forest and listening to the sounds of silence? Or so what is the sound of silence between two individuals? And especially when one is uh, a caregiver and the other is uh, a patient. Very important to be able to uh, take advantage of this kind of a, of, of, uh, uh, syntax. I think that some of the best times I... I'm very lucky, actually, Russ, because the, tree, the disease that I treat, um, Myelodysplastic syndrome, as you know, is a pre-leukemic condition. So patients live a long time often, and uh, we have a very unique way of developing long-term relationships because I'm seeing them every week or every other week and taking them through many, many physically demanding situations like severe, profound anemia, compromising the quality of life uh, deeply, and yet giving them blood transfusions, which suddenly reverts them back to an energetic self for a few days. And when I see them during those days, they're so different than when their hemoglobin was six grams. And taking them through this for sometimes 10 and 20 years and meeting them regularly every two weeks is a very unique privilege. And in uh, in these interactions, um, there are many times when we are um, uh, just listening to music, listening to things together, or just silence, actually, but being together, and then suddenly speaking.
speaking up and communicating at a level uh, which is so profoundly different. Well, I think silence is underrated. One of the advantages of being the host of this program is I've become a better listener and I've forced myself to become silent. I was thinking about the um, episode I did recently with Ryan Holiday where we talked about Marina Abramovich who sat in silence for days across from a stranger, a set of hundreds of strangers at the Museum of Modern Art for an exhibition a few years ago that documentary was made of it. It's an extraordinary documentary. And I think we have a tendency to think, well, silence is nothing. Silence is wasted. Silence is, is when nothing happens. And yet for me, increasingly as I get older and get better at silence, I'm not great at it, but I get a little better. They're the deepest times. The most unforgettable times are often just being present for someone. Um, and that must be a big part of your daily life as a as a cancer doctor. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think uh, many people who are devastated by silence and cannot tolerate it um, have to be distracted by all sorts of devices or general um, things in life find that once they learn how to appreciate it, it's silence is responsiveness. We can listen to things behind the clamor of the world. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to try something a little bit strange at the end of this conversation, but before I do, I want to let you close and and talk about um, if you have much optimism and you've seen a lot of suffering and a lot of joy, you write about it in this book in a beautiful way. Um, you're, there's some despair at the state of things, which I think listeners have heard in our conversation. Are you optimistic about the future? Do you think... Um, think there's hope for a better approach to, to these challenges? I almost feel like Leibniz, that <laughs> the world is the best of all possible worlds, because I do feel very optimistic. I, about I, think, I think that's Voltaire. <laughs> Does, I think that's Voltaire is, is in Candide. Is, is it also Leibniz? Does he say that too? So Voltaire wrote uh, Candide uh, as a, a parody of Leibniz. Okay. You know? He made fun of Leibniz completely. I didn't know it was Leibniz. That, he was poking fun at. Okay. Oh, no, it's absolutely. Dr. Pangloss is in Candide. That's who Leibniz is supposed to be because Dr. Pangloss was forever declaring in Candide that, oh, it's the best of all possible worlds. The nose is there because the spectacles had to rest on it. It's the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, so I, but, but at the risk of sounding like Leibniz, I do think that the technology is so superb right now, Russ. I mean, I could not have imagined um, 20 years ago that I would be living in a world when I go back to Karachi and I'm caught in a traffic jam. And when you're caught in a traffic jam in Karachi at the red light, often the homeless people and beggars will start knocking at your door. This started happening to me recently when in Karachi, a beggar started knocking on the door. And before I could bring the window down, his cell phone rang. <laughs> <laughs> and he answered the cell phone and looked very uh, concerned. So when he got off the phone, I said, is everything OK? Now I got worried about him. <laughs> and he said, no, no, everything is fine. That was my wife on the cell phone telling me that there's a bigger traffic jam near the university. <laughs> <laughs> she's telling me to take an Uber to get there. <laughs> <laughs> so technology has uh, such power to transform our uh, entire daily lives. I mean, when you asked me or when you commented earlier on, that's a very difficult, insurmountable almost problem. I beg to differ with you on that now, because I think that the paradigm can shift overnight like it did from a typewriter to a word processor. 
from having uh, telephone booths to make calls to even homeless uh, beggars in the most impoverished countries in the world having access to the um, to to computers who they are carrying in their hands with powers that were unimaginable just 30 years ago so all i'm saying is instead of going after the last cancer cell all the time yes we should continue doing that for our current patients but at the same time let's turn to the first cell let's set the new goal let's incentivize this goal financially and let the race begin and then what we have seen can happen is that the human genome required collaboration and competition simultaneously between hundreds of thousands of investigators but then what 20 years ago took 15 years to do to sequence the first genome and cost over a billion dollars today can be done in a few weeks for the cost of a few hundred dollars this is where technology can transform everything within a decade is what i'm saying and at the rate technology is moving it will be faster and faster going ahead i'm very optimistic for the future of cancer i want to close i said try something a little bit different i want to close with a um actually going to sing something which is a little out of character i don't know if i've ever sung i've probably sung something on this program before but um there's a paradox in your book, which is, um, as I've made it clear, I think there's there's a lot of uh, despair and sadness in the book, and yet there's an immense amount of joy. And you've really, all the patients who, many of them uh, who passed away, the ones who passed away are immortal because they're in your book. and Their song is, is out there. Um, and it's a really um, incredible thing. One of the things that your book forced me to think about is um, the preciousness of life and how somehow, how is it possible that we have this great gift? We know it's finite. We don't like to think about that it's finite, but we know it's our great tragedy and our great knowledge, our great insight. We, we go through life knowing it won't last forever and we think about it often as if it does which allows us to get annoyed at traffic jams and home repairs that don't work and all the petty disagreements we have with the people we love. And um, it's strange that we can go through life that way if we're not careful. Um, well, we all go through it to some extent that way. So I, when I was thinking about that and reacting emotionally to your book, I was struck by a song by Susan Werner. Uh, it's called May I Suggest. And it's, uh, we'll put a link up to it. It's a, uh, beautiful live version that she does. Um, but this is the way it ends, which uh, your book inspired me to think about more intensely even than I usually do. It goes like this. <clears throat> this is a song comes from the West to you, comes from the West, comes from the slowly setting sun. This is a song with a request of you. To see how very short the endless days will run. And when they're gone, and when the dark descends, Oh, we'd give anything for one more hour of light. And I suggest this is the best part of your life. So this is the best part of our oh. life. Oh, beautiful. Rob. So this is the best part. Well this is <laughs> me talking to you and whoever's listening. And um, it's hard to remember that. And your book reminds me to remember it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Russ. It's been absolutely a wonderful experience talking to you. And thank you for all you do. I love your podcast, by the way. My guest today has been Azra Raza. Her book is The First Cell. Azra, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. 
I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.